Hi everyone, Dom Famularo, back again, the artist series at a distance. I, I, I get such an incredible joy out of this because I get to sit down with these musical minds that are so empowering at the highest level. And what I'm amazed about this guest that I have today as a singer, songwriter, musician, and an incredible record producer, this energy is infectious and just insatiable of the deepest passion in what you do. Please welcome Narda Michael Walden. Narda, thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here. God bless you, Dom. Thanks for having me, man. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I got to start. You, you, you have such a wide variety to your, to your talent and creativity. And I, I got to try to understand that because the people that listen to this are people that are wide-eyed and bushy-tailed about trying to step into the music industry and you have so many aspects of this industry that you have such incredible ownership of and control over so i just got to go back music in your life in the beginning stages where you're surrounded with music where did that all kind of begin yes dom thanks for asking man as a kid i'm very very blessed to have a family that was all about music my dad wanted to be a drummer he was eight, 18 years old when he had me. He wasn't a drummer, but he carried around his best friend's drums was Bill Dowdy, who played drums with the three sounds. So he's around it, loved it. And he was actually born in Chicago and then had me in Kalamazoo, Michigan. My mom was 19 when she was, when I had, when I was born was, she's quite young, but in her family, she's the oldest of six kids. And those children are all around music. Edgar, Aunt Mary, who's the, uh, the queen of rock and roll, the twins, Vicky and Valerie, loved all the jazz and all the progressive music. So in Michigan, I'm really happy to say, between Chicago and Detroit, Kalamazoo, Michigan, gets everything. I mean, all of it. So that's a big thing that we're exposed to as a kid, you know? So you're taking in this music, you're hearing all different types of music, you're hearing jazz, you're hearing R&B, a little of everything. That's right. And I'm, I must say, as a first, as a young drummer, when I was really four or five years old, I always wanted to play on a pie tin. And a, and a box and sit in a high chair. I play along with Nina Simone, Live at Town Hall. I play along with Horace Silver's Six Pieces of Silver was Senior Blues. But what early powerful influences to hear that kind of music? That's, a, you know, that's kind of advanced music to hear as a young kid. That was the music they had going on in the house. So when did you start meeting other musicians and starting to develop your skills where you're starting to play with other players? When, when, when did that happen? I had a friend in Kalamazoo named Joel Brooks. He'd be 10, I'd be 11. We had a band called The Ambassadors and he played the organ, like a B3 organ. And I played drums and that was our first band. And we could go actually go into his uncle's club called the Ambassador Lounge and play for the opening artists that coming through town. And that was always great. And we loved a, a, a song by Jimmy Smith called The Sermon. This whole organ and drum trio thing was a, a highlight of my life as a little kid coming up. Yeah. Boy, the Jimmy Smith music was just so exciting and yeah. so yeah. in your face. It was just such great music. Yeah. So you're hearing this, you're playing along with some musicians, you're starting to kind of develop a style that that is allowing you to pull from all these different areas, from pop, from R&B, from soul, from jazz, from fusion. You're really pulling in from everything. Yes, and then as I got then like around 13, then I wanted to get my own band together in my, our basement, and we played The Who, I can see from miles and miles and miles. And that was a lot of fun, just to bash it, you know what I mean? So I really enjoyed doing all of it, just mixing it up, you know? So here you're going from, from listen, from Horace Silver to The Who. Let me tell you something, that's a pretty wide span. <laughs> That's a, pretty, that's a pretty wide span. So in this here that you're going on, so when did you get to Miami? When, when, did, when did the whole Miami thing start to happen? That came on after I left LA. I came to LA for a while to try to find a success. And LA was very, very tough, but I met some key, key people there. I, I got a phone call from a, a man named Sandy Toronto, the lead guitar player, played with Edgar Winter's band. He was down in uh, Florida, in Miami, and he'd heard about me. And he got me a, a ticket, my, my first, airline ticket i was 19 years old to fly down to florida to go meet him and when i got down there he really wanted to play like mavishnu free-flowing uh improv music so we had a, a big space like a big wrestling um gymnasium where the echo would come out you know so i had my drums and i mic the, the, the amplifier the, with the bass drum through a big svt amplifier he played strong guitar we bring a bass player and a cat named william piano and we would just go at it for for longest, longest periods, an odd meter or whatever it was meant to be, but loud and strong, where I could really develop myself powerfully. And it helped me tremendously. Where did you learn the odd meter thing? Because you, when I have heard you play, you flow in and out of the music so 
so comfortably. It doesn't matter what time thing that you're in, it doesn't matter how intense or how laid back it is. You have a way of just kind of like a chameleon, just adapting to the song and just taking it to a whole different level. Where does that come from? Two things. One, you mentioned adapting like a chameleon to the song. It is true. I love songs. I love melody. So I can play with melody. That's a big hook. But also I love this kind of um, spirituality of like the ocean and getting into symbols where they shh yeah, yeah. and feeling that spirit into the song. That combination of like, let it breathe and then let it keep it, keep, keep grounded at the same time. That combination I've always admired and I, and I like it. That it feels funky, whatever meant to be the groove, but at the same time, let it, if it's supposed to go out there, let it get out there. Boy, this is, this is a great, I see an educational book to come out just by you called Let It Breathe. Okay. What a great concept as far as how to perform and groove and feel a song by allowing the tune to breathe and you being and nothing more than just a set of lungs. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. For example, I love Buddy Miles, his live double album with his yeah. band, how grounded his band is with Buddy. Yeah. But I also could turn around and then love Billy Hart with Herbie Hancock of Immondishi. You mix those worlds together, presto. Then come along Billy Cobman, what he was doing with the first Mahavishnu Orchestra of Intermounting Flame and Vital Transformation, Ooh, and, and when, how funky he was with all the odd meters. That was mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Billy yeah. really was the one that told me to check out to check you out. And here I am on in, in the, you know New York and I I go out and I go to hear you play and I my jaw just dropped when I just saw how beautifully you you cut through the tune. So tell me about now Miami Mahavishnu second version. How'd that come about? Well, Miami because you mentioned Miami, there was a real breeding ground of so much talent at that time. Pat Matheny, Danny Gottlieb, yeah. Hiram Bullock, Clifford Carter, Patty Scalfo, who went on to marry Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. Down the street would be Jaco Pastorius. Mm. All this talent. I couldn't believe how much gift was walking around in, in Miami. So that was a great blessing to, to, to encounter all these lovely people. Then from there, the band I was with, with San Chirano, we were called the New McGuire Sisters. We then moved up to Connecticut. And we had a, a nice space way out in the country of, of a place called Canaan, Connecticut. And in Canaan, we had a big house, little cabins. I had a little cabin and we had a big barn. The barn was our recording studio. Beautiful. So in there, we could play all the time and record ourselves and really take it even further. In there, we then found Ralph Armstrong from Detroit, Michigan. He, he auditioned over the phone on upright bass. We couldn't believe how, how beautiful he was. So we flew him in and he became part of this band. He'd be 17 years old. Yes. So then I'm saying, here I'm playing with Ralph every day now. And then along came an opportunity to go and see the Mahavishnu Orchestra live in concert at Hartford, Connecticut. And I was able to get there uh, just in time. As I'm walking down the aisle, I'm seeing Mahavishnu and Billy Cobham going at it. <laughs> just the two of them in some odd meter of that. It's just so out there. But they played so tight and so beautiful yeah. that I just could not believe it. And I got up to the lip of the stage to look up in John's eyes and make sure it wasn't memorized what was really going on. And in fact, his eyes were rolled back in his head and it was like bullets of rivers just flying out of the amps for the longest time. Yeah. And I couldn't believe how beautiful they played together. And that's when I, I realized I wanted to be like that for my life. And I was able to get backstage that night and tell my Vishnu, my name is Michael Walden. I'm 20 years old and I, I want to be like you. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, well, my music is largely due to my prayer life, my meditation life. And I said, yes, I'm seeing on the back of your albums, these poems by Sri Chin Moy. He said, yes. He said, I'm going to go see the guru at six in the morning. So all this started jumping off. And then he gave me a call not long after it is to go meet his guru. And then that became a whole devotion of, uh, of surrender in my life. Well, it's surrendered to the highest level of spirituality and the whole Sri Chimnoy, this, this whole feeling that you've got from it, you are able to deliver that in your music so clearly and it lifts anyone up who's listening. So how are you able to develop all of that and, and feel that? How did that all happen? Well, in meditation, we learn to open our hearts and let God come through, let God use us, channel us. And we pray about it. I prayed about it with Mahavishnu Orchestra to be able to just give Mahavishnu what he needed. He, he was, he's my king. Yeah. 
John McLaughlin is my king. So whatever I can do to play, to inspire him is my total goal. So I pray on it. We all pray on it, you know? Yeah. And, and I've kept that alive in everything else I do in my life. If it's pop music, if it's Aretha Franklin, if it's, we pray on it. I really want this message to be clearly heard by people because this is, this is where the depth of the soul of your music is at, that you are able to surrender and serve each song, whether you are behind your drums, whether you are singing a tune, whether you're writing a tune or whether you're producing a tune, you are able to find that, that delivering of that surrender which is, which is what I love about what you're doing. So now you, you play with Mahavishnu, you're there for a couple of years. Then Atlantic signs you to your first solo album. Yes, but it wasn't easy. After Mahavishnu Orchestra broke up, I was lost because I was so sad about the breakup of that. What, what am I going to do with my life? Because Mahavishnu had been my total life yeah. as far as playing at that level. It's, an un it's unbelievable the height to play with someone like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was sad. What, what am I going to do with my life? And it wasn't until I found Raymond Gomez that I got the spark again, that I found someone that was of kin, kinship spirit who could really play and had all the rhythm about him. And then I could make some music to kind of get a label where they might sign me as an artist. And Epic paid me to make a demo. I got David Sanchez, Will Lee, and, and, and Raymond to play the demo. But then Epic said, no, we don't, we don't want to sign you. So I had to kind of prattle around. It wasn't until I found Atlantic Records, Ramon Silva said, you know what? We know who you are and we'll sign you. And I got very, very lucky. And then they gave me a choice of my producers, Arif Mardin or Tommy Dowd. And I was more on the rock side because of Mahavishnu and all that and what I wanted yeah. to get into. So I chose Tommy Dowd to be my producer and my co-producer, yeah. Boy, what a great call that was. Yes, right. What made you choose him? What, what was it about him that-, that, that Because I knew that he, with his work with Amon Brothers, you know, he understood that side of things. He yeah. also understood his work with Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin. And he was an engineer type, which I have been used to with Ken Scott, with Original Vision of the Emerald Beyond, Mavish. Dennis McKay was a great engineer, co-producer type personality. Uh, even with Jared, Jeff Emmerich with Wired and was right. a great engineer. So I understood the engineering side more, I think, which was, and it let me be a freer musician. So Tommy was a good choice for me at that time. So at this point, you know, uh, I cry, I smile and the awakening. This is all starting to now happening at this at this point. Yes, it's true. All these things were a part of my solo career. And but it wasn't until Atlantic Records said on my third album, Awakening, they said, now, guess what? Jazz rock fusion, as we know, has kind of gone sleepy now, kind of, kind of gone quiet. And if you don't have a hit record, a hit song, then we're going to drop you. Mm -hmm. And I just got married in 78 and I did not want to be dropped. Mm -hmm. And they said to me, you should know that disco and dance music is really the thing now. And we want you to come to New York and check out, check it out. And I did go to New York and I was inspired by the dance and the pulse. Boom, boom. Then everyone was just, just feeling the groove, man. It was groove time. I said, well, I can do that. You know what I mean? Then I heard a song by Rick James called You and I. You and I, do, 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 we'll be together. Do, 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 do. I was like, oh, okay. I can take Rick James vibe and, and disco and what i know i can do and mix it all together and i had a hit call i don't want to but else dance with you and it <laughs> saved my life i stayed on and they said now make another album and i made i should have loved you tonight i'm all right more dance music and it just kind of kept me going and i was able to go out and tour with pad labelle Sean khan rufus uh brothers johnson and that was a whole other audience that i had experienced with them my vision because that audience wanted me to say does everybody feel all right Say, go ahead on. All that crowd was like a different audience altogether. They wanted you to bring it hard, but party, party, you know? So I had to really understand that world. So how, how, where did the Patty Austin connection come in then? Patty Austin, as far as me producing her record? Yes. Patty Austin would come a little bit later. Quincy Jones and I had become best of friends. He was one that really inspired me to come a, a more devoted uh, producer. He said, we need more producers now. Interesting. And so because of that, I took it more serious. And then along the way, he asked me what I produce, Patty Austin. And this mm -hmm. is after I had Freeway of Love success. Patty was a great singer yeah. who I just so loved. And I just wanted to make great music with her. And we had a wonderful time together. So okay, that came back before I came to my, my studio here, but you like 84, right. around that period, uh, Patty Austin. We did um, The Rhythm of the Streets. Right, right, a right. A called The Rhythm of the Streets. Right. She's hot, man. Yeah, yeah. She's hot. So, so Quincy Jones, how'd you, how'd, how'd you meet Quincy in the connection? Back when I was um, having How Will I Know, Freeway of Love, the early success of those records, I was up for a Grammy. And in LA, 
I met Quincy and we became friends. He admired that I could make nice music and I was a staunch admirer of, of his work. And he kind of took me under his wing and he really kind of just, you know, encouraged me to do more of it. And, and it was just a, a real love fest between he and I. He called me Shorta, which means younger brother. I called him Borda, which means older brother. Hmm. So we just became very, very, and then he had another young artist named Tevin Campbell, who's 14 years old. He said, I'm gonna bring Tevin to you. I said, okay. So that we had a big smash for Tevin called, tell me what you want me to do. That was all because Quincy brought me to it. Well, it's amazing how, how in your life there has been fate and destiny that seems to just grab you and put you in the right place at the right time. But what's amazing is whatever situation you're put in, you always produce at a high level. You always deliver at this highest level. This really is this really is pretty special, Narda. It really is. Thank you so so much. I can only tell you that my parents and my grandparents are just wonderful people. They are hard hard workers, and I know by watching them what hard work is. So I I took that work ethic into the studio, and I made the studio work not feel like work, but but love bring that same work ethic to the studio, but then let the love take over. If it's having candles, if it's having flowers, if it's having a little stuffed teddy, teddy bear to give the artist, you know, just keep the vibe a loving atmosphere. And when, if I would do that, then the artist could like open up and go to, go to the higher realm where the music really wanted to come down and bless us. Yeah, yeah. You know, and also I would say also this, we would take our time to make the recordings and even get a, a singer come and sing it and backgrounds come and, come and lay it all out before I even got with the artist. So I'd have it a really together how I knew it should sound. And then when the artist would come, I could play them something they can, go, they can get excited by and then they can go do their thing and, and bring it and bring all the love. But if I ever got stuck, I, kinda, I knew what, what, what kind of work because I kind of worked it out previously. Yeah. So I think the homework is important. But this, this is where you talk about, about, you know, hard work and having that strong work ethic. This is something which, and, and you are an extremely disciplined person. So those qualities, listen, a lot of young kids want to try and find the easy way out. You always seem to look for the most challenging way that's going to deliver you the deepest results of what you're looking to produce or perform it. Where do you think that discipline all came from? Where, where, where that all the hard work and that ethic come from? My grandfather spent $100 in 61, 1962, to buy my first drum set. That was mm -hmm. a lot of money at that time. It was a big gift for me to have, a drum set, a bass drum, a snare, a cowbell, and a wood block, and a cymbal. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I got to Christmas time that Santa brought me a hi-hat. These are all beautiful things to have, and I was just so grateful to have these things. And um, I always wanted to just to play, play music, play drums, be able, be able to do what I do. I knew it was a gift. I wanted to just make my family happy, make myself happy, make everybody happy. But you know, you, you use the word grateful, which I don't want that to be a slide by. Gratitude seems like it is, you are screaming with gratitude and being grateful. I am. I look around me today, these beautiful lights, these beautiful, these, all these knobs and, and, and uh, <laughs> my studio, you must come here. Yeah. It, it just feels so beautiful. And um, people have come here from James Brown to everyone to just to give their best. So right. I'm, I'm breathing this air that they've, they've given everything. <laughs> and I'm just extremely grateful that this, this whole thing has happened, you know? That's how I feel, yeah. Hey, if those walls could talk for sure. Well, talk about, talk about some of the artists. I mean, you, 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 Aretha Franklin, how did that relationship develop? That's a gift from Clive Davis. After I got hot with Stacey Latizal, let, let me be your angel. And she was 11 year old girl, loving a two way street. And then the Sister Sledge, I started working with them and things are popping off. Clive Davis called and said, how are you doing all this? I said, well, I love music. I'm from Kalamazoo, Michigan. He said, well, how about you produce Dionne Warwick? I said, well, Dionne Warwick is my, her work with, with Burt Backrock and Hal David. You. Are, that's my teachers, Yeah, yeah. you know? And so he said, well, then go and meet with her. And I went to go meet with Dion. I played about 13 different songs in LA. And at the time she wasn't really feeling the music I was bringing to her. So I called Clive and said, for whatever reason, it's not really clicking. He said, don't worry. How about Aretha Franklin? I said, of course, I love Aretha Franklin. He said, well, just give her a phone call. So I called Aretha Franklin on the phone. I said, you know, I'm, you know, now I'm Michael Walden. I was calling and say, hi. <clears throat> and, um, you know, what do you do for fun? She, she might say, oh, I go out to a nightclub at night, you know, and maybe I see a guy in the corner I like. 
<laughs> he looks at me, I look at him. And it's kind of like, who's zooming who? I go, who's zooming who? <laughs> he goes, but uh, he thinks he's got me, but the fish jumps off the hook. The fish jumps off the hook. <laughs> See, and I'm writing this down. So this becomes my idea from her conversation to write a song called Who's Zooming Who? And then Preston Glass and I get together and he says, why don't you give me that idea you write on called Freeway of Love? Preston, I would have never thought of that. It's a great idea. So then we shape Freeway of Love for her and we get excited for Aretha Franklin. I put another song together called Until You Say You Love Me. I go back to Detroit and meet with her and her father had been, uh, who had been passed away out of, in a coma for two years. He got shot in the church and it took him two years to pass away. And then she, was, she had grieved it. She had grieved it. And now she's ready to record. So when she comes to the studio, she's very sensitive. I, she wanted me to massage her shoulder. I touch her shoulder very lightly. But when she would sing, it would just be like an angel, an absolute angel. And also on those tracks, I was bringing Prince mentality into the tracks where the machines, the lindrums, everything would be. I was trying to really bring a new sound up under Aretha now. So she could have a new life in the 80s. Yeah. Because Prince was killing it with Purple Rain. Yeah. And Quincy yeah. with Michael Jackson, all that. So we had to come like a new sound. And so they witnessed the, the birth of that sound with her voice. It was like, it was like awesome. Just awesome. Just awesome. <laughs> these these singers that you've had the chance to work with and 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 died along the way. I mean, Whitney Houston, another, another incredible voice that you were able to deliver tunes and hits and excitement and different sounds and unique creations that we had really never heard before was popping out. How did the Whitney relationship develop? Again, that's for the, for the uh, home of Arista Records and a, a gentleman who worked for Clive Davis is Jerry Griffith. Hmm. During, during the making of the Free, Freeway Love, Who's Zoom and Who, Aretha Franklin album, which was my total attention, I got a phone call from Jerry Griffith. He's Jerry Griffith says, he says, hey, you gotta do a song for a Whitney Houston. And I go, Whitney Houston? He goes, yeah, Sissy Houston's daughter. I go, Sissy Houston sang on my first album, Garden Love Light. <laughs> Tommy Dodd brought her in the studio. She's, she's awesome. And he, she had a daughter. The daughter was 11 years old oh. in the studio. Well, he said, that's not Whitney Houston. She's grown up. She's now 19 years old. You got to make time to do a song for her. I said, but I'm working on Aretha. He said, yeah, I know. But guess what? You can't. You got to make time. I said, well, OK, uh, what? He said, I got a song hook uh, called, Free, uh, called How Will I Know? I said, well, send me the idea. He sent me the idea and it was a great hook, How Will I Know? But it had no verse. Yeah. I said, well, Jerry, can I write some verses to it if I want to do it? He said, let me contact the writers. So he contacted the writers, Shannon Rubicam and George Merrill. And they said, okay. And I was able to compose some verses and got my, my band, who was already cutting the Freeway I Love, Randy Jackson on bass, Corrado Rucci on guitar, Frank Martin keyboards, Walt Tosinavi on keyboards, Preston Glass keyboards. And we threw down on how will I know? I wrote to the piano. There's a boy. Dun, dun, dun. I know. Dun, dun, dun. And the band just started kicking it. We just made a great recording of it. I called Whitney Houston and say, I know we haven't worked together yet, but can you can you sing high? Because I'm going to make the opening of the thing really super high. She goes, yeah, I sing high. I said, okay. <laughs> and I, then I cut it. I went to New York and I met with her and she walked in like a million dollars. She looked so beautiful. Her cheekbones, her eyes, her hands, her body was so beautiful. And she went out to go sing it and she nailed it. Well, come on and listen to it, you know? And she came in, if you're, you're me and I'll be her. Whether it was on the playback, we're playing it loud. She looked at me like, are you checking out how good I sound? <laughs> I'm like, damn, this girl's confident, man. And it was killer, you know what I mean? Now, then I, got, I realized why Jerry made sure I produced her because she was going to be a, the new thing. We had never seen that kind of beauty with that kind of talent and control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That chick had enormous control. Yeah, yeah. From the head voice to the to the, to the middle voice to the chest voice, all going on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just smacking you with it and confident about it, like Muhammad Ali. So I was like, damn, man. <laughs> You're so true. I mean, I, I had the chance to hear her several times live and just 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 and to talk to her. But you mentioned about your musicians. Talk about Randy Jackson. I had the chance of playing with Randy. You, you surround yourself with such great musicians all the time. Yes. Randy is a genius bass player, mm. person, ears, can pick a hit with me. Like if I had, if I had five songs, playing, Randy, what's going to be the hit? That one? Yep. He had that kind of intuition about him. 
from yeah. down south, down uh, New Orleans area, Lake Charles, Lake New Charles. Orleans. So he has all that soul about him. But then on the recordings for How I Know, the Rita Franklin stuff, we discovered this Moog bass synthesizer, which he played with one finger. This this real thing, this gliss, became a trademark we used on everything because it made people get up and dance. Yeah. And he understood that world. So my band was incredible. Our guitar had Corrado Ricci from Italy, and he'd bring the European sensibility. The funk, which we had learned from being on the tour with Brothers Johnson and, and, and all those all the funk bands, he brought that idea, but he also brought the melodic sense that the Europeans would dig onto. So I loved him for that. My guy, Frank Martin, Walter Asanoviev, Preston Glass, my keyboard players, they are great musicians and understand all kinds of music. So I was really able to pull any kind of thing we needed. We needed a Joel Zalon sound. If we needed it, whatever it might be, Motown vibes, pressing glass, bling, 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 bling. Whatever it was we needed, we could, we could get. So I'm just so happy to be able to work with these great people who were so kind to me and giving and, and fast. Brother, we didn't spend no time on those sessions. We go fast, 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 because I knew the spirit's fast. The spirit gives you like one, two hours to burn. Get what you need, because then it kind of goes away. You don't want to stay around too long. Yeah. Also, I'll say, even in producing the singers, I'll always get the ending first. All the spirit I need, all the ad libs, all the f run, fly, 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 fly. I get all that in that first hour, first hour and a half. Then go back to do verse and be more technical. Boy, how, how interesting. How do you how do you adapt? You know, because you're going from like someone like Mariah Carey to Barbara Streisand to Lionel Richie. You're talking about Stevie Wonder and Jeff Beck, Sting, whatever. What, what, you, you are able to just kind of like and this this is where your gift comes in. And it's screaming as loud as it can be, because you're able to feel and be so compassionate that you can feel what the artist has inside and you know how to open them up with the right key to unleash that. Where did that skill come from? Where, where, did, where the hell does that come from? Because it's beautiful. My mom was very compassionate and loving, mm. kind of like, like a therapist. My mom had those kind of gifts of a therapist just as, a, as naturally. And I think I kind of just borrow that skill from my mom of just let the person speak. And Mahavishnu would always say, listen, listen. So when I'm with people, I just try to listen. Yeah. You know, the song is a star. We, we all want to serve the song. Right. But in getting them open up, if I listen to them, then they can find their, their happiness. And then once the, the molecules take over, the endorphins take over, now we can both have fun with it and keep, mm -hmm. it, keep it bouncing high. Once you bounce it high, again, you got one, two hours to let it bounce high. Get what you need. It feels good. It feels good. It feels good. Like it's, we're swimming in the water. We're swimming. <laughs> See? Then, okay, that's all good. We did everything I want to get. Get it, get it. Now go home. Then we spend hours to comp it, put, put the best bits together. How do you find the balance between this creative artistic side that you have, which is, again, all the different songwriting, the musician, the record producer, and then you've got the business side that you've got to balance and keeping that going, and then you've got the personal side of your family. How do you, how do you balance all of that? Well, back when I made these records that we're talking about, I didn't have um children i had wife but not children my wife would be very giving of me to let me work which was very sweet and very kind so that was always always beautiful children now i realized is a very big undertaking they have to have you around like i was out touring with journey but i couldn't stay on a tour i had to come back home my children need me yeah so that's why i have to and i understand that now it's a big to do i have an eight-year-old named kelly a seven-year-old named kayla and a three-year-old boy named michael <laughs> so I'm, I'm home i'm daddy now you know but in, in balancing my life normally, the love is so important. If you love things, which I love my music, I love the music. And like Quincy Jones taught us, you know, he says, when these little hairs in my hands stand up, then around the world, millions of people stand up with, with these hairs. Go, oh, that's beautiful. Because I would say, well, Quincy, how do you know you have a hit? He said, well, with these hairs stand up, you know? So now I, I also try to feel like the, the, the chill. If I get a chill, something me, I know I'm on something really great. So I let that lead me, let the feeling lead me. To let the love lead me. Then business and everything comes after all that. Hmm. You know, the business will, will take care of itself. You know, you have good people with you, a good lawyer you can trust, your team you can trust. You don't need to like a lot of people, just a few you can trust. Yeah. That's important. 
Like, I love you, you love me, we can trust each other. I haven't known you that long now, but I know I can look at you, you're a good person. So we, we work together, see, it's like that. But that, that, that takes a real level of, of I, I guess that's where the spirituality part comes in. You, you really have, you're opening yourself up, you're making yourself vulnerable, but you are like a mirror, you're giving off such a great vibe that anyone that's in your presence has got to feel that. Well, thank you for that. But something you said is really true. Vulnerable. Yeah. The vulnerable thing is how God can do the work. Hmm. Vulnerable means I'm willing to let the spirit do something. I'm willing to be an instrument. Like there again, I'm letting, willing to be the instrument, let God come through. You know, we're working on the song, but I'm willing, I'm open to the, if the song needs to go this way, the song needs to be a little faster. The song needs to be changed the key. The song needs a more, more hardcore chorus. Whatever it might be that we're willing, we're, it was just the spirit of being willing. That, yeah. that, that alone, like you called it, vulnerable. Let's the spirit come through and help you help guide and make it what it needs to be. As opposed to, no, it's got to be this. No, it's got to be that. No, it's got to be my way. That kills it. Yeah. You got to like, just let it, let it kind of, and it'll show you if you let it, it'll show you. <laughs> yeah. That's the key line is, if you let it. That <laughs> okay. Be, okay. That's a powerful line. <laughs> if you let it. And many, many people are afraid of it and they don't let it and they, they shut it down. Okay. Yeah. And, and one more thing about that. Check this out. I've learned that the spirit will bless me in the early stages, be it a demo, be it the first time we play the song, be it the first thing that we got, that, that first inspiration of let's try this, let's try that. The spirit can be right there. So then in then producing it or taking it further, you can get all the way from what you first got. But then you go back and listen to what you first got. You go, wait a minute. That yeah, was it right there. We didn't need to go all down those avenues. We had it right here. All we got to do is just take this idea that the good Lord gave us from the very beginning and just bring life to that. So often I, I realize there's strength in the first inspiration of your intuition of what you first can feel. Like if a, a singer, sometimes the first thing they sing can be the, the wonderful takes, the wonderful ideas because they're, they're still healthy and they're excited. There's magic in, in the early things we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, those those first takes are, are those first and second takes really have some 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 pure instinct in it that if you allow it to rise and let it come up like you're saying you'll hear it yeah 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 you know with with covid these past couple of years people have just kind of shut down they've they've gotten you know quiet to themselves they've they've been d depressed and, and and challenged you have just cut through it like a hot knife through warm butter you just keep on going. How does that, where does that come from? Well, I have to thank Neil Schoen because Neil and I started an album uh, called The Universe, a solo album for Neil. I, I, I love Neil. I wanted yeah. to make a solo album uh, like, like a Jeff Beck type of thing where he's, he's playing a lot of melody and be able to blow. And he came through and we put our minds together on The Universe album and we had such fun doing it. Then when COVID hit, we were going to go out to on a, a journey type of playing some shows, but no one could tour. So we brought Journey, Neil and I in here in my studio and started writing songs for Journey. And then getting John Kane to do lyric and getting Randy Jackson to overdub bass in LA, getting Arnell in the Philippines to overdub by Zoom vocals. <laughs> so here I'm at midnight in the Philippines overdubbing his vocals, getting, <laughs> you know, and putting the whole thing together. We made so much music, it's like a double album. That was our work during COVID. That was a lot, a lot of our work during COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Just wonderful, wonderful. You know, what, you know, if I think about it, you know, and just in how disciplined you are and what you do, what motivates you? What drives you? Many things drive me. Uh, I love success and the progress that, that comes with success. Mm -hmm. I love God to be happy with me. God wants me to feel like I'm here. I've been given a great opportunity to achieve to make people happy with music. People need music, I know that. Like brushing our teeth, like eating our food, like a nice shower, like a nice bath. We need all these things. So God gave me that, that gift in my heart and the knowledge to like do something about it, to bring the good music to the people. So my happiness is making people happy. My happiness is making a hit. My happiness is like when you see these. Beautiful. Like, like keeping this kind of vibration in the world. Beautiful. You know, that's like, that's what turned me on when I was a kid, when I heard Little Anthony Imperials going out of my head by Teddy Randazzo production. Yeah. When I would hear, you know, Stevie Wonder, fingertips, everybody say yeah, yeah, say yeah, yeah. 
Say yeah, 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 yeah. Da 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 da. Boom, bada, boom, da 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 da. Ba da 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 da. Ba da 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 da. I hear all that. I mean, like, damn. You know what I mean? All of it. All of it. All of it. So that's why I'm. I'm excited about music. I'm excited about what we can do with it. And once that comes on, then I'm taken away. I feel good. But what a feeling. You know, I just had the chance last week of interviewing Anthony. He's 80. He's still as enthusiastic and like yourself. He's still pushing hard. And just to hear you mention his name and talking about that, it just go back to those great memories of going out of my head and those great songs that these guys produce in beautiful harmonies. Yes. And when you watch him live, he goes into a spell. I love to watch little Anthony and you know how he was just in his spell and he was singing songs and his eyes and his head. We just feel it so deeply. I was just like, damn. All the folks I love just feel it so deeply. When I saw Stevie Wonder walk on the stage, you know, he looked like, like this kind of alien, you know, when he would get to the microphone, he was just like, he'd get everyone in his palm of his hand. Yeah, yeah. He was 12 years old. Yeah. Great Charles, a live album in Newport with his band. You hear his foot stomp the temples, you know, whatever it would be. He's just so incredible. All these folks, like J. Hendrix, all of them. Yeah, yeah. You know, they have the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. It's all so beautiful to see the charisma. Yeah. I loved all that. I loved all that. Well, you have definitely, you, you are right up there with them because your charisma and your enthusiasm, and again, your just your sheer, sheer passion is so obvious, and you wear it you wear it on your, on your chest as a badge of honor, which is beautiful. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Really, really beautiful. Thank you me. know, you are involved with, you, you give so much the Cancer Society, to you know, schools, educational programs, as far as you know, music programs in schools. Just talk about that for a second. How, how do you, you're giving back, balancing all of this with the producing and what you're doing, and you still make the time yes. to give back. I wouldn't be here had it not been for people giving and helping me. So I take that little seed and just keep it alive in my own heart. Uh, my grandpa gave me my, my first drum set. My mom encouraged me to keep playing music. It was, it was always a giving spirit, a very natural thing. And so I, I know the world needs that. I joined the board on the Grammy board, and then they would say that music is going out of schools. There's no, there's no program for music in schools. And so then I took it upon myself, whatever I could do to visit schools. And that's how our foundation became um, kind of important to bring kids in the studio, yeah. sing, do shows. And the more shows I would do, I would bring in a, a featured artist, be on Dionne Warwick or Ronnie Spector, or Martha Reason Vandellas, Carlos Santana, Clarence Clemens, Dewey Brothers. And then they would sing and play with the kids too. Then I realized that was a powerful thing. These kids would grow their confidence. The star would grow their confidence. The combination of which. So the more I was given, the more I was receiving. It was just wonderful. Yeah, well, this is the Nardo Michael Walden Foundation. This is this is just such a deep, deep program that it just keeps on giving. It keeps on inspiring the young generation. It keeps on bringing all this new talent and and rising it to the top of to the cream. It's just amazing to witness all the great talent that you're still finding now. Yeah, I know they're coming through, man. Uh, and I and I ask God about it because I really want to find the voices that want to come here and work. I'm looking for it always. I'm looking for the people who have the right attitude that I can be around and it's, and it's inspiring to be around, you know. Boy, that is so beautiful. You know, Narada, we can talk for hours for sure, but I mean, in closing, I want you to look and, and give some guidance to this next generation mm -hmm. of what you would say to them. And they, they may have one aspect of your life. They might just be a singer. They might just want to write songs. They might just be a musician. They might want to get into producing. Here you are doing all of it. What kind of advice could you give to this next generation that can give them the guidance and the, and the, and the clear path for them to find a level of happiness and or success? Whatever it is that you do, do it well. If you want to sing, sing in tune. Be able to hold the notes. Be able to captivate that you can hold the notes, hold the melodies, you know, with soul. You know, you, we've learned from the greatest teachers of all, Aretha Franklin, Whitney Houston, Ray Charles, all these great singers. So there's no excuse that we can't be great by learning from them. So learn from the greats. And if you're a musician, again, learn from the greats. Records are some of our greatest teachers. Listen, listen to those records and learn. And I'm realizing there nowadays, there's so many great people coming up because they have access to YouTube where they can watch their favorite people and they can assimilate. And there are so many kids coming up who are able to assimilate. But at the same time, 
just keep in your heart a love for yourself, a love for yourself, a love for what you're doing, and a love for the people, love for the, for the situation that you're in. You get to do this. We get to have music. We get to have a life. We get to have air in our lungs. That life is a gift. So we want to honor this gift. Honor ourselves with more love. Honor the people with more love in the music. Keep this love going. Keep the tradition of love going. This is, this is the God way. God knows that those of us who are chosen to do music, it's a blessing. So we honor it with, with our grateful hearts. We honor it with, with goodness. And we want to inspire the world. So I say less profanity in rap. Don't need it. Keep rap inspiring. You know, keep music inspiring and bring the world up. That's my advice on a, on a broader scale. Well, absolutely beautiful, you know. You know what's amazing is from the over 40 years when I first heard you, I was so impressed and so inspired. And through your career, as you've gone through all these different avenues of performing and singing and writing and producing and, 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 and playing drums at such a high, exciting level, for myself as a drummer, you have always been an inspiration and you've always been a person that has inspired people to aspire. You are the clearest example of that, that you're taking someone and you're giving them this soul of what you have been blessed with. You're delivering it in such a way through all these different people that you communicate with. And a little piece of Nardo Michael Walden is in all of them. That goes out, that impresses people, that inspires people, and that lifts them. And you are still doing it stronger than ever. <laughs> thank you, brother. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very kind to of me. I really love you, Tom. Thank you so much for inspiring me today. Your words and your attitude toward me have really lifted this, this Zoom conversation that we're having to a, a very lofty level. And I'm really, really thankful for this uh, chat we're having today and for this lovely uh, discourse on a high level. And you're asking me very high questions, you know, and, and it's, uh, you're pushing me and I love it. So I want to thank you for that. It is I when I have a chance to sit down with a Da Vinci and a Michelangelo in an art form, I want to make sure that the questions that I bring to them allows them to be inspired to share. You have done that today. You have inspired as you continue to do that. Nardo Michael Walden, on behalf of the Artist Series, we thank you so much. I love you. Keep on going. I look forward to seeing you in person at some point in the future. Thank you. Very kind, Dom. God bless you and all your fans and listeners. Thank love. you so much. Dom Famulata here, the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.